Creationists typically attack any sciences that do not agree with their preconceived notions of what constitute reality. One of the numerous fields of science they attack is atomic theory, specifically radiometric dating. Some of the common arguments that creationists use. Radiometric dating is flawed and is based on unproven assumptions. Radiometric dating is based on circular reasoning. Were you there? Radiometric dating was planted by Satan! Some of these are patently absurd to even the most uneducated person who isn't insane. Others, however, need to be addressed. Specifically, the claims that radiometric dating is based on unproven and unprovable assumptions and that it is based on circular reasoning. What is the justification for claiming that radiometric dating is based on circular reasoning? Well, this can be specifically related to the fact that real scientists utilize radiometric dating on rocks and fossils. Creationists therefore claim that radiometric dating of fossils assumes the age of the strata that they're in, and radiometric dating of the strata assumes the age of the fossils that are in. Clearly such a claim is absurd. There would be no point in such a system if that were truly the case. What I am about to demonstrate is that this is clearly not the case. So without any further ado, this is the radiometric dating series. Radionuclide decay is a phenomenon that obeys a precise mathematical law, namely the following law. This is a differential equation and states that the amount of material undergoing decay is a linear function of the amount of material present. Furthermore, the minus sign indicates the process results in a reduction of material remaining. Rearranging this differential equation, it looks like this. Integrating this, we have... Our limits of integration are, for the left-hand integral, the initial amount at t equals zero, and the amount remaining after time t. Our limits of integration for the right hand are t equals zero and t equals tp, the present time. Thus, we end up with... By an elementary theorem of logarithms, this becomes... Therefore, exponentiating both sides, we have or the final form. The half-life of a radionuclide is defined as the amount of time required for the half of the initial amount of material to decay, therefore feeding this equation for the decay law, cancelling n0 on both sides. By an elementary theorem of logarithms, we have, therefore, Alternatively, if the half-life is known, but the decay constant is unknown, then the decay constant can be computed by rearranging the above to give, which allows us to move seamlessly from one system of constants, half-lives, to another, decay constants, and back again. If the initial amount of substance, N0, is known, e.g. we have a fresh sample of radionuclide prepared from a nuclear reactor, and we observe decay over time period t, then measure the amount of substance remaining, we can determine the decay constant empirically as follows. Therefore, on the left-hand side, the initial amount n0, the remaining amount n, and the elapsed time t, are all known. Therefore, the decay constant can be computed using the empirically observed data. Empirical data for a vast range of radionuclides now exists. K and Labey's tables of physical and chemical constants, devised and maintained by the National Physical Laboratory in the UK, contains among the voluminous sets of data produced by the precise laboratory work of various scientists a complete table of nuclides. Now, given all of this exhaustively compiled data, plus the data on major decay series, which arises from the observation of which radionuclides decay into which other radionuclides, it becomes possible to trace the decay of suitably long-lived elements in geological strata, locate specific isotopes, determine by precise quantitative analysis the amounts present in a given sample, and compare these with calculations for known decay observations in the laboratory, Given that several isotopes have extremely long half-lives, 
One can determine the age of a rock sample where multiple isotopes are present by relating them to the correct decay series and utilizing the observed empirically determined half-lives of laboratory samples to determine the age of a particular rock sample. Thus, errors can be eliminated in age determinations by the use of multiple decay series and the presence of multiple long-lived isotopes. Any errors arising in one series will yield a figure different from that in another series, and the calculations can thus be cross-checked to ensure they are conciliant. Referring to the data tables in the sidebar, a number of isotopes of interest have been selected. These are isotopes where half-lives have been determined to lie within a specific range, and which moreover are not known to be produced in the Earth's crust by any major synthesis process except for the various technetium isotopes which can arise if molybdenum isotopes are coincident with uranium isotopes in certain rocks. The isotopes in question in increasing atomic mass order are as follows. Now the feature that all of these isotopes have in common is this. If the Earth were only 6,000 years old, then measurable amounts of all of these isotopes should be present in the Earth's rocks. So what do we find when we search for these isotopes in Earth's rocks? None of them are present in measurable quantities. Now one can safely assume that at the end of 20 half-lives, any measurable amount of a particular radionuclide has effectively vanished. The amount left is half to the power 20 that was present originally. So, even for isotopes of common elements, this fraction represents a vanishingly small amount of material that would test even the world's best mass spectrometer labs to detect in a sample. It means that at least 20 half-lives of the requisite isotopes must have elapsed for these isotopes to disappear. For example, tin-126 being absent must have disappeared over a period of 20 half-lives. 20 times 100,000 years is equal to 2 million years. The Earth therefore must be at least 2 million years old for all of the tin-126 to have disappeared. Calcium-41 being absent must have disappeared over a period of 20 half-lives. 20 times 103,000 years is equal to 2.06 million years. Therefore the Earth must be at least 2.06 million years old for all of the calcium-41 to have disappeared. Similarly, at the other end of the spectrum, samarium-146 being absent must have disappeared over a period of 20 half-lives. 20 times 103 million years is equal to 2.06 billion years. The Earth therefore must be at least 2.06 billion years for all of the samarium-146 to have disappeared. This is an inescapable conclusion from observational reality given that these isotopes are not found in measurable quantities in the Earth and would be found in measurable quantities if the Earth was only 6,000 years old. The fact that no Samarium-146 is found places a minimum limit on the age of the Earth of 2.06 billion years. And of course, dating using other isotopes with longer half-lives that can be measured precisely has established that the age of the Earth is approximately 4.5 billion years. Now, since the decay of these isotopes obeys a precise mathematical law, and this law has been established through decades of observation of material of known starting composition, the provenance of all of this is beyond question. The tables that are linked to in the sidebar are the result of something like a half a century of continuous work establishing half-lives for hundreds upon hundreds of radionuclides. Not one of them has ever been observed to violate that precise mathematical law under the kind of conditions in which those materials would exist on the Earth if they were present. The majority of those isotopes are nowadays only obtained by synthesis within nuclear reactors and observations of known samples of these materials confirms again and again that not only does the precise mathematical law governing radionuclide decay apply universally to all of these isotopes, but other half-lives obtained are valid as a consequence. The laws of nuclear physics would have to be rewritten wholesale for any other scenario to even be remotely valid, and that rewriting of those laws of nuclear physics would impact upon the very existence of stable isotopes, including stable isotopes of the elements that make up each and every single one of us, none of which would exist if the various wacky scenarios vomited forth on creationist websites to try and escape this were ever a reality.